welcome again to our nine o'clock service today and thank you so much for joining us for worship. I think we'd all agree as uh, 2020 is drawing to a close that it's been a year like no other and we'd be glad when it's over. But let us hope and pray that things will continue to improve and it won't be too much longer before we can meet again face to face for worship. Nothing could even settle for mask to mask for worship. But as the new month begins, we also begin a new series of worship focused topics. This time it is based on the very first promise of God in the Bible and how that promise was eventually fulfilled. But before we begin, let's now commence with a time of prayer. So let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can again meet together as a, a small community of your people to remember our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is your unspeakable gift to us. We remember him especially at Christmas time, born, yes, as a babe in a manger, but he grew to be the Saviour of the world when he died for our sins on Calvary's cross. We want to honour him, honour him in our thoughts and our words and our worship this morning. And we ask too, as we open your scripture, that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher to help us to understand the lessons that are contained in it. So we commit our time together now to you in the Lord's precious name. Amen. It's estimated that there is up to 5,000 promises of God recorded in the Bible. And yet, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. For it is impossible to God to lie. He is totally trustworthy and what he has promised has either already or one day will be fulfilled. So turn in your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 3 and we'll be reading some verses from Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is a sad but important chapter in the Bible that explains why things are the way they are in today's world. And it records the entrance of sin and also the fall of mankind. Now, you may be aware that there are only four chapters in the Bible where sin is not a problem. The first two and the last two. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 tell us what could have been. And Revelation chapters 21 and 22 tell us one day what will be. In the first seven verses of Genesis chapter 3, the serpent, who is Satan, tempts the woman by questioning God's motives. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, eventually she succumbs to the serpent's deception and she eats the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then, with very little coaxing from his wife, from her wife, his wife, <laughs> the first man, Adam, also eats the forbidden fruit. And instantly their eyes are open and they realise that they are naked and so they cover themselves with fig leaves. Then from verses 8 through to 13 of the chapter, after a futile attempt to blame someone else for their own sinful actions, the disobedience of the man and the woman is exposed and how often over the centuries has uh, attempts by mankind to pass the buck occurred, and no less so today. We see it in all sorts of ways, don't we? It uh, continues to be a strategy used by guilty people to try and absolve themselves of any responsibility. You know, it's not my fault, you know, someone else made me do it. But while such attempts uh, to conceal the truth might succeed amongst human beings, God sees the heart and everyone is accountable to him. So in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3, when the man and the woman knowingly and willfully disobeyed God's clear instructions, mankind became a fallen creature without excuse and without hope. In the words of the English poet John Milton, sadly it became a case of paradise lost. In verses 14 through to 19 of Genesis 3, God judges the serpent, the woman, and the man. Today, our worship focus is found in verse 15, 
and it is part of God's judgment of the serpent and it contains the first ray of hope of how God would set about restoring or fixing a broken world and how mankind could once again be brought into fellowship or friendship with God. And for this to happen, sin must be atoned for and the power of Satan must be overcome. So then let's read verses 14 and 15 of Genesis chapter 3 and I'll be reading from the new NIV translation. And it says this. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and a woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. What does this mean? Well, the first thing to notice as we look at the verses in verse 14, that the serpent is cursed. And if we read on in the chapter in verse 17, it says that the ground is cursed. But God does not curse the man and the woman who were created in his own image. Yes, they would be punished for their disobedience. They would become mortal creatures. They would be expelled from the garden. And they will be separated from God's presence. But because of his mercy, their lives would be spared. And secondly, notice that there will be enmity between the serpent and his offspring and the woman and her offspring. And it would be a blood feud, it would be ongoing hostility, a spiritual life and death battle. In the first round of the battle, Satan tramples upon the woman. But amongst her offspring or her seed, a redeemer would come who would crush the serpent's head, even as the serpent strikes or bruises his heel. Now this verse, Genesis 3 verse 15, has been called the Proto-Evangelium which means the first good news. The early Christian writers called it the mother promise. Back in 1710, Matthew Henry, in his extensive Bible commentary, said this about the verse. He said, Here is the dawning of the gospel day. It will be through the offspring of the woman that the serpent, who was instrumental in the downfall of humanity, himself would be crushed. Although it would not be until Genesis chapter 12 with the calling of Abraham that the story of redeeming grace would be told then through the history of God's covenanted people, Israel. Yet there is a clear indication of what was about to happen way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now the author of Genesis, of course, could not have seen, as we do, that this descendant of Abraham that this coming Messiah, this last Adam, as he is described in 1 Corinthians 15, and this proper man, as he is uh, called in Martin Luther's hymn, A Safe Stronghold, Our God is Still, this Redeemer would become known, and he would be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Did you notice the three things about this person in verse 15? Firstly, his incarnation as the offspring of the woman. Jesus was a real human being, not just a spiritual phantom. Secondly, his suffering as the serpent strikes his heel, but it would not be a fatal strike. In fact, it turned out to be the serpent's undoing. As it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, that is Christ, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And thirdly in verse 15, we see, of course, his victory as he crushes the serpent's head. Because God is just, he must judge sin. Yet because he is merciful, he gives grace to the sinner. So it's not surprising, is it, that at the precise moment of the fall of man, God promises a remedy. In his commentary on Genesis chapters 1 to 11, 
David Atkinson includes quotes from Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 26 and 55 when he writes this in his commentary he says we can stand within Genesis 3:15 and look forward in the knowledge that the power of evil hidden behind the all too subtle mask of the serpent will one day be exposed and overcome on a cross outside a city wall. On that day, Christ will be the victor. He will disarm the powers and authorities, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. On that day, the sting of death will be withdrawn and the last enemy will be defeated. Wow, I wish I could write like that. In the New Testament, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, we read, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Did you notice that? Under your feet. Now, what Paul is saying here is, yes, the offspring of the woman would eventually crush the serpent's head, thereby fulfilling the promise of Christ's victory over Satan, but it will be a victory which all believers will share in that same victory. Remarkable. But the defeat of Satan will come in stages. On the cross, sin was atoned for and the power of death was removed for all who believe in Jesus. Next, as recorded in Revelation chapters 19 and 20, when Jesus comes as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it says that the ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan will be seized and sealed in a pit for a thousand years. And finally, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 10, Satan will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur from which there will be no escape but but it was this crushing blow to the serpent's head inflicted on Calvary's cross that set in motion this chain of events from which Satan could never recover. Yet until that time, there will be ongoing hostility between the woman and her offspring and Satan and his demonic forces, including all those who choose to serve in his kingdom of darkness. And as Christians, of course, if we lapse into sin, which we do, we know that because of the cleansing blood of Jesus, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Throughout our lifetime, of course, Satan remains a potent enemy which we must resist as the accuser. He is determined to destroy the faith of God's people. But we remember, of course, that he has been cast out of heaven and his temporary reign is here only on earth. He has no authority and no place in heaven. And that, of course, is where our security and our future home will be. The devil has already been mortally wounded and his days are numbered and he knows it. So, dear friends, with this first promise of God in the Bible impressed upon our hearts and in our minds, let us give thanks for Christ's victory over Satan and let us be encouraged. So let us stay strong and stay positive. And until next week, goodbye.
Good morning everyone. We're rapidly coming to the time of the year when we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus. At this time of the year we often hear the divinity of Jesus questioned by someone who professes to be a Christian and makes me feel profoundly sad. How could just another man possibly have the capacity to be my substitute before a holy God? As just another man, no matter how good or noble, his sacrifice on Calvary would have had no power to save my soul or yours. How hopeless our future would be. But in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man to emphasise his identity with us. And in John's Gospel, Jesus on at least three occasions talked about his oneness with the Father, that is God, while he dwelt in his earthly body. He was truly human and he was truly divine. I love the story in the book of Ruth of the concept of the Goel or kinsman redeemer. The nearest relative had the obligation to come to the aid of a helpless and enslaved relative. And although Boaz wasn't the nearest relative to Naomi, when that person reneged on his obligation, Boaz willingly took up that role. In the same way, Jesus was under no obligation to us, and yet he willingly became our kinsman redeemer. Jesus as the Son of Man emphasises not only his humanity, but also his mission to save us who were trapped in the bondage of sin. In Luke 10 and verse 9, when Jesus was talking to Zacchaeus, he said, The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. That's all of us. So as we partake in communion this morning, let us think about what it cost Jesus to veil his glory, leave the delights of heaven and communion with his Father, Suffer the ignominy of being born as a helpless human baby, having to allow others to meet his most basic needs, to be hungry, thirsty, weary, suffer temptation, to know the pain of grief in losing a beloved friend, and so on. But because he was truly human, we are assured that he is able to feel all these things as we do, Yet he remained truly divine, always without sin. So Jesus doesn't just know about our life's difficulties, he's actually experienced them. When the nature of Christ debate was raging in the early church about 380 AD, Gregory of Nazianus said that what is not assumed is not healed or redeemed. By this he was saying that if Jesus had not become truly man, then there was no possibility of anyone being redeemed back to God. How true this is. The incarnation of Jesus is at the heart of the redemption story, God becoming man. It really is the most amazing thought. Jesus as a perfectly, as a human, perfectly represented God as he truly is. So as we pray together now and then we will take communion. So I hope you have your bread and wine ready. Our loving God and Father, impress upon our hearts this truth that your Son was truly God and yet truly man without sin. Thank you we can freely declare this morning that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who lived, who died and rose again to redeem us back to you. So we thank you in his precious name. Amen.
is join me in prayer, in our pastoral prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day, we first of all want to thank you for the very fact that you allowed your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and live on this earth as a human being and come as a, a child and ultimately with the purpose of being able to provide for us the means to have a right relationship with you and ultimately spend eternity with you. We do particularly come and uh, pray for some of the events that are happening around the world at present and pray for our uh, leaders, particularly uh, people like Scott Morrison, Daniel Andrews and their teams. And we are mindful of the tension between Australia and China at present. And Lord, we do pray for real wisdom for our leaders as they uh, communicate with uh, people like China and other countries and that we might uh, be, be spared some of the uh, things that could happen and have happened historically as nations uh, start to uh, have issues with each other. We do also bring before you church leaders at this time. We do pray as we go into the season that's uh, post-COVID, as it's called, Lord, we do pray for real wisdom as to how best to, uh, particularly to in terms of our meetings, how best to meet together if, yeah, as we're able. But also, Lord, we do pray for those of us who can't meet and uh, we do pray just for the right decisions at the right time in terms of meetings and things, decisions related to that. And we do pray too in terms of the plans for next year, uh, some of the plans around what, the potential for extensions to, to our building and property, and also uh, for the uh, right choice of a youth pastor as we're considering those things at present and been interviewing people. So we just look to you, Lord, for all these matters. We do remember those who are in aged care at present, we particularly think of Maureen Weller, for Don and Roma McKelvey, and for Graham Eldridge. And Lord, we do just lift up them before you. And others who probably uh, have a sense of isolation, particularly as they've been through this COVID um, situation that we've been in. And we do pray as we come out of it, and many with many people probably still apprehensive, uh, in terms of engaging with people, we do just lift up uh, each person uh, that's in that situation before you. And we do think of those who are unwell. We particularly think of Glenda Watts and for Emmanuel, uh, both who've been suffering from cancer and suffer with the effects of cancer. And Lord, we do just lift them up before you. And we do think of some of our missionary folk at, these, at this time, we do just lift them all up in love before you. And now we do pray that, uh, that as we go into the uh, Christmas season and preparation for it, we do pray that we won't get just caught up in the celebrations and forget the real reason why we're even celebrating Christmas. So Lord, we, we do just uh, commit these things into your hands today and we do pray that we might be able to demonstrate to people what it means to celebrate the Christ of Christmas and not just celebrate a holiday or meeting together with friends. So Lord we do just bring all these things to, to you in lifting up our hearts in praise and worship to the Christ of Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.